Okay, we're recording. All right. Yep, I got red lights here, so we should be good. Mm -hmm. We good to go? Yep, go All ahead. Right. Thank you, Sierra. So um, welcome to everyone that's joining us today. Um, my name is Paul Durie. I'm the branch manager here at Covington. So this is a, a step out for me just because um, this gets to indulge my hobby more so than my profession. Um, you're, you're better off for most parts with Sierra and the rest of the crew up in local history. But um, this was one thing I've been kind of working on in my spare time. So um, kind of taking you along for the journey just in terms of what I've been able to, to gather as I've researched my own family. And so hopefully some of it's something that will help you. It's more geared for beginners just because that's kind of where I'm at. Um, by no means an expert, no means an expert on Irish history, but uh, hopefully we can share something from it. Um, and so if you have questions, throw them in the chat. Um, hopefully Sarah will help me keep an eye on that so I don't get totally engrossed in what I'm doing. But um, so you're going through this for the first time with me, so bear with me. Um, how Irish are you? Um, feel free to throw in the chat how Irish you are. So we already know Marla was uh, somehow 24% and it's a mystery 24% at this point, but um, I'm roughly about 44%, just, just shy of uh, 50. Um, 14 of the 16 of my great grandparents on my maternal side were all born in Ireland. Um, a couple of them you'll see on the screen there. Um, but as you can see, fairly, fairly Irish names, fairly common names, which is, which is makes the joy of, of researching that much more difficult when so many people are kind of named similarly and congregated similarly. But um, so we were fortunate enough that a lot of them kind of stayed in the same place, unlike Sierra's that kind of moved way out west. In some cases, most of mine stayed and settled in central Ohio. And we'll kind of introduce some of them as we go along. Um, but that's kind of just to stake your cred um, in terms of, of Irish. So, our, you know, aside from the Clarks and the Watkins, um, most of that side, it's not the Oduries, it's the rest of my mother's side. Um, these are the two hooligans that um, I'm passing my genes on forward to. And so one even named Jameson. So um, just to try to make sure everyone knows he is Irish. So enough about that. So um, what we're looking at today, and hopefully everybody can hear me okay. If they're not, please throw something in chat. Um, I'll try to speak louder or not. I'm in my office, so hopefully nobody disrupts me. But um, the big thing for Irish genealogy, I think, is, is starting with this question is was your Irish ancestor um, still in Ireland at the beginning of the 20th century? Um, so the answer to that question kind of will allow us to kind of see which way we go. Um, if it's, if they were still there in 1900, 1920 in that range, we have actual census records and you can kind of start a path on, on researching them the same way you can research um, census records here in America. Um, then you can also turn to, um, birth, marriage, and other vital, vital records. Um, if not, the biggest problem that you have in Ireland, and whether you've heard about it or not, was the destruction of the General Records Office in 1922 during the Irish Civil War, which sprung up after the treaty ending the Irish-English um, War of Independence kind of uh, splintered the Irish folks. Um, so a lot of those records were lost, including um, censuses from 1821, 1831, and 1841, and 1851. Um, most of, about 50% of the Church of Ireland records were lost um, as a result of this, um, in addition to just a huge, beautiful building that looks state-of-the-art, if you can see on the right, um, kind of pretty much reduced to rubble. Um, you know, it's not all to blame on the um, burning of the, of the four courts and the siege of the four courts, but um, Census records in 18, uh, seven, or 61 and 1871 were destroyed almost immediately upon it being completed. And um, 1881 and 1891 were pulped for paper during a shortage prior to uh, World War I. Whether those would have lasted um, the destruction of 1922, I don't know, but probably not. So what we have is 1901 and 1911 and um, kind of the, the not, not just say bright spot, I would say, but um, so there's a kind of the Irish government, the Irish institutions kind of trying to make amends for some of these things have actually gone um, pretty far in terms of making what records do exist 
really available and available freely. So the census records, for instance, are available free. A lot of the civil registration um, documents will be available for free. And so there's a big movement to at least try to make some amends for it. Um, I'll just kind of mention this one briefly, just because it's coming up on 100 years of the anniversary, or 100 years would be of the destruction of 1922. And so they're trying to recreate a virtual um, uh, treasury record of the records office and trying to piece together what fragments survived. And so it's kind of a neat project and it'd be curious to see how much they're able to kind of put together. Um, the, the site itself was massive and it takes forever for the loading, but hopefully they improve that over time, but not gonna help us so much on the, on the journey, but it is something that's kind of coming up that they are trying to work on fixing. Um, so what we're gonna do is kind of start with um, some census records. So we're gonna start assuming you had family over there in Ireland still, and, and they were kind of late comers, not so much of the, the earlier migrations due to the famine and things like that. But um, so we have the 1901 and 1911 census records that are fully available, um, images and searchable. Um, Ancestry, Family Search, uh, Find My Past. You can search those same census records on those sites as well. What I'm going to present to you is kind of the National Archives, um, who got behind the effort initially, uh, searching on their page for a couple of reasons, uh, mainly just because they have some additional information that are available that you may not catch if you're searching and, and viewing the records through one of the other commercial sites or, or through Family Search. But, um, I'm gonna to try to flip through, so hopefully this works. Sarah, let me know if this doesn't work for some reason, but hopefully you're seeing the National Archives page launch here. Um, and again, Sarah's put some of these links into the um, uh, chat and we'll share it by email or just reach out to one of us at the end. Um, so as you can kind of see, and I encourage, we're gonna look primarily at the census here, which I'm gonna kind of circle in the middle. It kind of changes depending on when you locate the website. So sometimes it may be down in the left corner and it kind of moves around. So to change your eyesights on stuff, but so definitely look around to see some of the other digitized collections they have uh, with different resources that they have. They have research guides and stuff. There's a lot of information out there um, just to kind of help the researchers uh, navigate these things. So definitely take advantage of those because I, you know, I'm, I'm picking up something new as I go and just familiarizing yourself with names and how things work in Ireland is just a little bit different than how it works here. So we'll go ahead and click on the 1901 census here. And there we go. So again, this is more of an informational page. And so you really want to kind of look for the census search website here, which I'm kind of going to click on, which is kind of not as easy as some of the commercial sites that get you to a search screen right away. And then at the top in the blue bar here, you'll look for search census. So it's a fairly straightforward kind of um, searching. You, build, you have options for 1821, 31, 41, 51, mainly because there are fragments that did survive, much like some of like fragments from 1890 have survived and things. But for the most part, you're really only gonna most likely get results, but hey, you never know, lightning could strike in one of these earlier years. Um, I forget where they said most of them are kind of up north, I believe, on some of the records that survived in the northern counties. So, but, so we'll go ahead and start in 1911. And as you can kind of see, you've got a, a more search options. We'll kind of get back to it. Oops. I don't know why I clicked out of here. Uh, there's an option over here for browsing, and we'll kind of touch on that a little bit later. What I'm going to start with is something fairly common. So, um, a name like Patrick Murphy, and you'll see um, the, the challenges that will emerge immediately. So if we don't have a lot of information, if we don't know a, a county of, of birth, uh, the DED is a, a district and a, um, a, a district within the county. So if we just look at Patrick Murphy, you'll see right here, if we don't know much more than just a name and an age, you know, we have 586 different Patrick Murphys to try to sort through just within the census here. Um, and so it's, it's kind of, you'll see when you do results, um, even though we put 35, you've got results on this first page that are age 39. And I don't really, doesn't really seem like it's factored in the age, depending on what you put in. It does limit your results in terms of, you're not going to have people older and younger than like the five years that we had set up, but you can't really adjust it and it's there and it doesn't really start you at 35 as the starting point. So I'm not hundred percent sure how they do relevancy but it's definitely not quite as good as what you're gonna get maybe on Ancestry or some of the other Find My Past pages. Um, so 
So in this particular case, um, if we knew the county, hopefully you know the county, uh, that might be able to narrow that down. Um, if you do happen to know a district or a town, townland kind of information, that's what we're trying to get for. And we're going to spend a lot of the time today trying to talk about how to find that information out, because that's really critical um, to try to narrow it down. Um, so as you'll see, this is kind of going to the more search options. So if you know the religion, you know, that may help you limit some people down. Um, occupation, that may help. You know, this particular one, you're going to see he's a bootmaker. But if we knew that, we could search by different occupations. If you know if he was married at this point or not, um, based on maybe you have a marriage record or you knew from censuses later on that they were married in before 1905 or something like that. Um, so you can kind of add any one of these um, pieces here. The part in the box down here at the bottom is going to be um, exclusive to 1911. You won't see this in 1901. They added these much like they changed the census every year in, in the United States. Um, so they added a number of years married, children born, children living, which is, you know, as we well know from some of the other census, very inf interesting information, very good to kind of help you map out the full scope of the family. But, so we're going to kind of get back here to, to Patrick Murphy. Um, so in this kind of case here, if we happen to know that he lived in, let's see, Cork, we can narrow that down to 123. So it's if you can get those information in terms of what county they lived in, or let alone townland, you can narrow those results down pretty clearly. Um, but what you don't also get is like the ability to add a second member of the family, which you can do a little bit more easily on the other sites. So that is a limitation in terms of searching on here. Um, we're just going to use, let's get back here. All right, so we're just going to use this first one. We're going to pretend that this Patrick Murphy, who lives in Wood Quay in Dublin, is, is the Patrick Murphy we're looking for. If you're clicking on that particular page, you're going to be able to see this is the members of his family. So as you can kind of see, wife, daughter, you've got your relationship. Um, if you're looking, and you can do this on the previous page as well, this little show all information box up here on the top, these are the, you can view the rest of the um, information from the record itself. So if you're looking at a results page and you wanna kind of try to compare people at a quick glance, you can turn on that show all information and kind of see who's married, who's maybe single, you know, because some of that information may, may help you kind of narrow down your list of results. But, um, so this is going to see Patrick and his member of his family. Um, so again, if you turn that on, you'll see all that information for the rest of, rest of the family. It Does, doesn't present it very well because it goes off the screen. But um, the things that you want to look into is why I kind of direct you to the National Archives site is the view the census, it, census images. It gives you more than just the, the image itself. Um, and the images for the censuses in Ireland are really just by household by household rather than like kind of the page by page where it's street and, and house is on just an endless stream. Um, if we pull up that household there, so you'll see the actual image for the, uh, which should match all the information you saw on the other page. And just like anything else, you wanna kind of pull this up and confirm there's no errors in transcriptions and the ages match up and you don't have an 89 instead of a 39 or something like that. Um, you know, but here's the occupation that you get. Um, nice for the 1911 and 1901 census is you have a column here about where they're born, if in Ireland, what county or city. So a lot of times you're just going to get the county, but sometimes you might get here. So at least you get the city of Dublin within Dublin, because um, it's also the county. So you may get good, valuable information depending on how specifically they answered that question. Um, Again, the occupation is good because you'll see in certain, certain marriage records and other things, the occupation of the father um, is often listed or the occupation of the, uh, of the parties, the, the grooms and things like that would be there too. So you might, might be able to use that information to kind of match up different things. And you've also got a street. Um, but if, if you're getting to here, you just want to always kind of make, make notes. If you're finding ancestors, make notes of the little town information or the parish information just because you may see those things reappear later on. Um, and, and sometimes they change slightly, but um, if you go down through here, the other things that you wanna kind of point out is um, an interesting part, the house and building return forms. 
And so this was, you know, kind of an additional spot that the census takers took. And it was more information about the houses themselves and what they were made of. So they're looking for information about what type, what the walls were made of, what the roof was made of, how many rooms were there, how many windows were there on the front of the house. So mainly to kind of get a description of the house, the quality of the house, and they're almost graded, a first degree, second degree house. Um, and you'll see, these are all numbered one through nine. And if we go back, um, the residence of the house was actually in number 12 is the one that Patrick Murphy was living in at the time. So you may have to go to some of these additional pages. I click the right one here, I went too far. And so this is your opportunity to kind of see who else was living nearby. Um, so these are the other neighbors that would be here. Normally you're seeing those on the census sheet, but this is a way that you can kind of view who, who was living in the, in the general vicinity. So you, you might wanna just check out all of those different pages just to see, and you know, especially if there was, um, you know, because a lot of times maybe um, a daughter married um, a young man who lived three, three doors down, so to speak. So if you're looking over here, number of the dwellings, so you're getting to number 12, and then you can see Patrick Murphy over here. Um, so you're kind of getting an idea of the house that they're living in, which is basically a five, five rooms in this dwelling. Patrick Murphy himself has got two rooms for his family of nine, so it's not exactly luxurious living. Um, but in terms of trying to get a sense of, of what the family was like and what family life was like, um, you're not listed when you saw Patrick Murphy's family return on their form. You know, there's also another Murphy living in this house, in this dwelling, um, in one room by herself. Um, but Mary Murphy, we don't know who Mary Murphy is. Could be relative, it could be pure coincidence, but it's kind of one of those you probably want to make a note of. Maybe you want to research that kind of person, but that's the advantage of, of looking at these forms. And sometimes if you're searching through Ancestry or Family Search, you know, they may give you a link to the archives, but they may link you right to that census form rather than the landing page where you can access some of the additional forms. So it's, it's always good just to kind of get in here and, and take a look at the full picture and see what you're seeing. Um, but I always found that was kind of interesting just to kind of see the state of the family and, you know, who else might have been living around. Um, so that's kind of um, a glimpse into there. So I'm going to kind of back out a little bit. The same kind of thing would happen in 1901. Uh, we're looking for Patrick Murphy in here. So we have 452 in 1901, a little less than we had the last time. But so if we're going to look for this, let's just say let's, this is where we can maybe use some of those other additional searches and, and we'll add, let's see if he was maybe a bootmaker still 10 years prior. So just adding the occupation takes us way down. And so we don't necessarily need to know, but just that one element alone um, gives us an interesting one. So we know he was kind of in Dublin. You know, we've got somebody that's 30 instead of 39. And so Merchant's Quay, which is not the same as Wood Quay, but hmm, let's take a look. Um, and we can kind of see these are actually kind of matches the family from before, um, ages and names. So we're feeling pretty good that this might be here. Uh, the one thing I'll tell a lot of things that I, I as I've done a lot of my Irish research is I, I end up Googling a lot of things. And just in terms of Googling wood quay, merchant's quay, what is a quay, you know, there's a lot of things that are just kind of foreign to me. And merchant's quay turns out is literally right next to wood quay. So, you know, this is particularly a kind of a case of everyone's family grows and you need a larger home. They moved a little bit down the road for a little bit larger home, it looks like. Um, but again, so here you've got the same options in terms of the census image, so you can view the actual return form and see. So as you can see, it's only his direct family that's on here, you know, but you've got that same information. You've got the same house and building return form that's here that you can kind of get more information about the dwelling. Oops, I forget what number they are. So this is, they're number 21, so I think that's. So again, so you can kind of get that same things, but just note when you're pulling up these, um, kind of look for here, look, look to note which poor law union it's in, look to note the divisions. I would, I would make notes of all of those different things, the streets and the wards, the baronies. So it's in terms of trying to just nail everything down to townland, parish, baron, you know, county information, 
just the, the more you can get a kind of a clear picture of all of those things, because you don't know it, it, certain records may pull back on, on the parish side, some may go down to the townland level. And the more you know, kind of it, kind of spell out exactly where that townland or, or parish may exist, um, will help you kind of sort through records as you go. So you've got 21. So there was like 21-5. So he's the fifth, fifth member of that building. So he's, he's down here. Patrick Murphy, as you can see, they were living in a one room in that building with their five family members. So it had to be a little bit crammed. You know, they didn't move up a whole lot, but it's better. But if you look above, there's also another Murphy that's living in that, in that same dwelling. So there's a James Murphy that's right there too. So again, if you were just looking at the results, you maybe would have missed this. Uh, maybe it helps you, maybe it doesn't. Could be a dad, could be a brother, could be an uncle, could be nobody at all that's related. But um, it's curious enough that they were in the same building. It's probably worth checking out. Um, the one thing that you'll kind of run into in terms of Irish research is you're going to have to get off of just searching your own main line and searching as many um, siblings and cousins as you can to try to really find that one nugget to get back into some of those older records since we don't have census records to kind of take us back where we can use family members to kind of help build that trail and timeline you know you might be jumping 50 years back and you're going to need to kind of figure out where what part of that town or county that they came from or else you're going to be trying to separate 50 patrick murphys from each other and it's, it's going to be very difficult um, so that gets again. So that kind of gives you that same um, same glimpse into their life, and in terms of in terms of chronicling and telling that story. Um, so that's why I like to send people to the National Archives of, of Ireland um, website, just because you can get these. Because I know I've looked before when I've searched in Family Search, and, and you they give you the link to the archives, but sometimes they just link you to this form, and maybe you don't know the other form exists. So. Um, so that's why I like to at least start here. And if I'm saying, you know, in a lot of kinds, you know, a lot of researchers are used to just searching all of those different forms just to kind of, or all those different sites, uh, especially when you can't find somebody. But um, if you're going to get here, just make sure you can kind of, you can search in those ancestry or family search, but maybe kind of come here once you've narrowed it down and then try to find them here and just make sure there's not other things. Because sometimes there's, there's additional forms here that might be there for the family. So, all right. Let me kind of flip out of here real quick. But that's kind of how that would work. Uh, I minimize this. And if I did that right, this is, in case the internet wasn't working, it was just kind of, kind of show you some of these different things. Um, so again, the biggest things is, is kind of the marital status. And really that we're born is the one thing I would look into because if you get lucky, maybe they do give you a little bit more specific in terms of townland information, not just county level, but um, anything we can do to narrow it down. All right, this we kind of covered. This is again, this is taken from Family Search. So this is kind of that same record for him. So when you find it, you get a little bit more clear. It's not horizontally across the screen, but if you clicked on that, it kind of takes you right into the record. So, all right, so we're all here. So that's kind of the census. Um, so again, we only have two to choose from, so it's kind of a short walk. Um, but if your family was there, that allows you to kind of help build at least ages and names, and you can start building to kind of look back from. So the next thing we can turn to, at least you have some information about hopefully that you know that particular person was born in Dublin City. If we're looking for civil records for birth, we at least have maybe three or four or five different names of, of people that would have been alive after 1864 that we can look for those records that may have tips and, and links to get us to the next generation back. Um, so the next thing I want to kind of just talk about is, oops, sorry, let me take a drink real quick. Are those civil records? And so when it comes to civil records, uh, the big year is 1864. That's when the law was passed, kind of uh, requiring um, births, marriages, and deaths to be recorded. Um, one exception to that would be marriages, um, and you'll see that on the screen here that non-Catholic marriages um, were started uh, in 1845, um, but 1864 for, for Roman Catholic marriages. Now, this is the civil side, so the church records can go back much farther, um, as we'll see a little bit later, but um, the big site here, what you want to do, um, and you, again, because they made these, published them, and put them out for free, Ancestry, Find My Past, a lot of them have index them and made them searchable on their different sites. So you can do that here too. Um, but some of those you may need a subscription or if it's not still continued 
forever remotely available for Ancestry uh, through the library's website um, or find my past, but you can come into the library and search those. But irishgenealogy.ie is free. You don't, you know, you can just search that from home. Um, so we're gonna kind of go into that. And you, you'll see here too, when we get into it, um, they just updated these, so they just added a year. So there's basically like a hundred year um, limit on public information in terms of births, you know, 75 years of marriages and 50 years for death. So very similar to over here. So let's hope this one launches and we'll get to, to Irish genealogy. So this was the update that they just had, which just says we added another year. Um, so with this part here, so what we're looking for is at the top, um, and we can, we'll come back to church records a little bit later on. Um, and again, so these are all just different things I'll point out. Research help is here, useful links. A lot of the links that are going to be in the chat and stuff are probably going to be found in all of these. Um, news and updates and whatnot. But we're just going to go ahead and search on civil records for the moment. Again, very simple search screen. You've got another option here for more search options. Um, and I encourage you over here, some good help as well. So if you're not sure what like the civil registration district is, that's what kind of what we saw before where it said the DED, um, that's the district and the registration where those records are filed and kept. So there might be five, six, seven, eight different districts within one county, depending on the size and the population. So um, understanding those, um, the, the big thing I always point out here is, you know, it's, it's not necessarily the county that you're searching. And so you may not know those districts um, so it's tougher to add that until you can kind of get them narrowed down. But once you kind of know it, you can kind of uh, narrow it in. Um, so we're going to search for another fairly um, common person. So we're just going to choose Michael O'Connor. Um, and we're just going to search. So you have the option down here for birth, marriage, or death. And we'll kind of go into more search options in a minute, but you can add some more details on that. Um, so if we're searching for Michael O'Connor, say that's all we knew. Yeah, this is kind of annoying because you're going to have to deal with this quite a bit when searching, as well as this. So you have to agree to, and if anyone goes to read Section 61 of the Civil Registration Act, um, I have not yet, but I keep clicking this box each time. So nobody's knocked on my door yet. Um, but as you can kind of see, Michael O'Connor, again, another common, common variation of surname and forename. There are 918 different people born between 1900 and 1910 in Ireland. So if, if we don't have anything more than that from a, you know, from a family uh, history in terms of talking to our own ancestors or uh, death records or our own census information, it's going to be tough to find them if we don't at least know a county. Um, and as you can kind of see, that search box on the, on the main part for district are basically going to, these are all the different options that have results for a Michael O'Connor. Um, so you, you can kind of see while some of these are, if you get down to Cork, that's the Cork district within the Cork County. So um, even though that's why I said, if you knew, if, if, if you were looking for Michael O'Connor in like County Kerry, um, you're gonna have to know that that also refers to, let's see, which is the ones that are in the, um, I don't even know. Kahir Kaveen, I don't even know how to pronounce that one. Why did I pick that one? That's not a good one. But Dingle is in County Kerry. And so, you know, if you searched on this front screen, uh, see, this is what I mean. Hopefully we don't have to do that again. Yeah, so if you search County Kerry, even though we know there's 19 or 900 of them, there are no results and that's even counting birth and marriage and death. But there are six districts within County Kerry and there's plenty of results there. You just need to know which ones they are. Um, I think Tralee is one, but you can kind of see. So if you're able to narrow it down to a portion of the county, Listowell is also in County Kerry. And so like Tralee is there too. And I think one of these, I think I had this actually pulled up on the search somewhere now. I won't get ahead of myself. What you can do is you, you can kind of search for registration districts within a county. There's plenty of places that have those listed out and there's six of them in like County Kerry. But so as you can see, if we don't have any, any information, this becomes very daunting to try to figure out exactly which Michael O'Connor. So hopefully you've got maybe a, a specific actual birth date 
for a, a more of a closer range on a year. So it's at least from military service or something like that, that you may be able to reach down. Um, but if you do have some additional information and you can provide it, um, the nice part on um, Irish birth um, civil registrations is that you can add something like the mother's surname. So if you did know that his mother's name was Flynn, you don't need to know much more than that to kind of get down to a real manageable list of like six people. So if you have that information, maybe that was from his death certificate or something like that, that does allow you to really, um, really limit that list and take it from 900 to six. So that's why you wanna just make sure you try to accumulate as much information as you can um, from the records that we have here before you start kind of jumping into Ireland because it, it could be that little nugget or that little town that really helps, you know, take it here. So we'll just say, for instance, that we, we know that this person was from County Cork, you know, and so and we know this was Flynn and maybe we knew it was June or something. So we're pretty certain that this is our Michael O'Connor. Um, so once you have that results, you can view the image here from this page. Um, and again, this is where I'll kind of make sure, always make sure you note if, if you determine that this is your ancestor, just make sure you note what registrar's district is Queenstown and the Union of Cork and the County of Cork. Just kind of make sure you list out those kind of um, chronologies of, of towns and that because you know Queenstown might be something that helps narrow something down later on. Um, so here's you'll see um, this is our Michael O'Connor here, uh, number 244. Um, as you can see, 18th of June. And what's interesting is nice here, and this is where again it doesn't show up on the other screen, but if you look in the information. That's the place of birth. And so it's a little harder to tell there, but that's like Bally Brassel, B-A-L-L-Y-B-R-A-S-S-E-L. -S -S -E and again, and that's what that's that crucial like townland information that you can really find. So those that's the information you really want to make a note of because that's maybe where the family was from. And hopefully maybe they'd never really moved very far from Bally Brassel. And maybe you can take that and go back a couple of generations with that information alone. So you've got Michael John. So even just make note of any other names you can, just to kind of helps with naming. Um, nice part here is this is, you've got surname and dwelling place of the father. So you've got Michael O'Connor, so he's a junior or the third, fourth, who knows. Um, but at least you've got a father's name and also Bally Brassel. Um, the nice part, and we already know that because we searched with Flynn, but if we didn't know what that was and we maybe just, we knew he was born on June 18th of 1902 in Cork, and this is the only one, maybe we're able to narrow it down and we are able to gain maybe the mother's maiden name. So then that allows us maybe to look for Michael O'Connor and Catherine Flynn's marriage record, which could then hopefully reveal the next generation back because the fathers are all listed on the marriage records. Um, here again, this is where I said I'd like to include what the occupation of the parent was. So um, maybe he was a, you know, kind of like in our former case, you know, if it was a farmer, if it was a bootmaker or something that's a little bit more unique, you know, maybe that was a family trait that was passed down. So maybe it was a bootmaker, son of a bootmaker. But farmers are going to be a dime a dozen, but there might not be as many bookkeepers or seamen, things like that. So this one is in mining and, you know, this one was a painter. So um, just to kind of look at those kind of things and make note of that. Um, so this, this next column here is going to be your informant. So that's going to be Michael O'Connor. So again, it was a uh, required for one member of the family to report and register um, the birth. And so this happens a little bit more regularly that according to what I've read, you know, the closer you're getting to the turn of the century, the earlier you get toward 1864, the more remote areas of the, the, the country that you get into, that may or may not have happened so regularly or so timely. Um, but, you know, it was required. So a good chunk of them are. Um, but this is the date when it was registered. The register is probably not going to come into play very much, but that is really good, mainly just because you get townland information, hopefully, and then you also get the mother's maiden name, which allows us to maybe take that next journey back. So um, the civil registration uh, or the civil records um, do come in very handy um, when you're looking at those kind of things. Um, so we'll kind of do a quick one here for, um, for marriage. And so, whereas we use the mother's surname in, um, for the birth, we're gonna to wanna to kind of look here and there's a box for a second party um, for this one. So we'll just kind of do a, a mock one for 
John Murphy, and maybe we know John Murphy married Mary Donovan. Uh, let's see. Let's narrow this down a little bit. Uh, so this was a marriage somewhere around 1925. All right. Oops. Did something wrong here. So you're going to kind of see, let's see. No, I think I forgot to add. Um, okay, well, I don't know. I think I had added cork in here at some point. So let me, 32. It's still longer than I had before. This is the, the problem I was telling Sierra about before is when you, you do it, and then all of a sudden your search results seem to have changed. But um, oh, wait a minute, maybe I didn't do. Yeah, that's why I didn't. I didn't narrow it down. Let's see. Okay, still a little bit more than I was expecting. But um, so as you can kind of see, these are all the different results that you're going to get. Um, so you'll see some of these. They might be witnesses. So it's picking up some of these things in, in parts of the, of the record. So um, most of your most recent or relevant ones should be towards the top. Then it's just a question of finding them. Okay, so this is John Murphy and Mary Dunn. So the interesting part here is that you're gonna get some kind of potentially valuable information is that they'll give you the status or the condition. And you can both see that he was a widower and she was a widow. A widow. So at that point, they were of full age. So they were over, I think, actually, I should look that up. I'm not sure what is determined full age in Ireland at this point. Um, but I haven't seen anything that was not marked full. So it's kind of probably the same thing, that they were at least 16, 18. Um, so at least you know that there's, at least in this particular case, prior marriages. Um, he was also a, good Lord, I don't even remember what that looked like, but you've got address, I'm guessing that's a farmer or something. So you've got addresses and you can kind of see they were living on the same street, not far from each other. But you've got the father's name and surname. So you've got Edward Murphy and John Harrigan or Horrigan, and he was a carman. So again, so you'll know she married into a Donovan, but she was originally a, Hor a Harrigan. So that again allows you to maybe track that back down um, where you might be able to find uh, a death record for a Donovan that's on that street if that was where they were before. So you just want to kind of make sure to look at all those information as much as you can. Um, so this is going to tell you where there was uh, the church that was held. Um, so this was uh, Cathedral Church. Um, and I think it's there, but that's the same kind of thing up here. So you've kind of got the Union of Cork and the County of Cork. At this particular part, we knew they were in Cork. Um, there again, that's where I was kind of kind of jumped the gun. And I think when I first did this example, I, I wasn't really thinking that uh, the things that you kind of run into with counties is that there's um, there's like um, you know there's counties named Cork or Kerry or Tipperary or Limerick. There are also districts within counties that are also named Cork and Limerick and Tipperary, and sometimes they have, <laughs> they're crossing over. So it's easily to get confused in terms of, am I searching a district or am I searching the county? Or if you see results, just, just make sure you're looking at and make sure it's kind of referring to either a district or a county. And there, there's an example here that I think we'll, sh we'll see that a little bit later. Um, back out here real quick. And death records as well. So if we're looking for, so if we're looking for a Patrick Harrigan that died somewhere around right before the turn of the century. Um, and I think this is the example that I'll kind of have of, um, so if, if we knew Patrick Harrigan from other things, from down from the family, we know the Harrigans descended from maybe County Limerick. Um, you're looking at these, and you may be quick to, to rule out 
um, these because they say Tipperary. And then you, you may jump to this one because it says Limerick. But if we're looking at this one, this is another example. Of definitely pull up those images and look for those images. Uh, you're going to get an age at death. So that will certainly help you narrow down maybe potentially who you're looking for. But always look at these kind of, because this is, the district is in Tipperary, um, the Union of Tipperary, but it's in the county of Limerick. And so when you actually go to find Patrick Harrigan, and he's the first one on the screen here, um, you've got him, a male, a widower at 88, um, he was senile decay, but you'll see over here the date and place of death, uh, so 25th of December. And then it's, again, this is where you want to kind of make note of any of these things that give you that kind of town land or, or more, um, less, something less than the county level information. So you've got Ballyfreen and County Limerick. So if you just looked at that first page and you saw Tipperary and maybe you ruled it out, definitely look into, into the records a little bit more because this is kind of a case of there's a, a district of Tipperary within the county of Limerick. And so that, that's that stuff I've run into several different times and it confuses me. Um, and so I've kind of started really looking closely at that kind of stuff. Um, so just kind of like with death certificates and things like that um, when you're searching in the US, there's gonna be an informant. The informant's oftentimes a family member. In this case, you've got, looks like Kate Harrigan, um, who was a daughter. So it's nice that in cases, it's just the qualifications, residence. Again, this was also in Ballyfreen. So it's hard to say, was this where he was from? Was this his house? Was he living with a daughter? Were they both there? But at least you've got two names and a town to kind of search further with. Um, and again, so that's just when it was registered and reported to the registrar. Um, so that the, the way it would kind of work, they would report it to the registrar, the registrar would make copies and then send the copies down to, to kind of, to be filed at the general records office type of thing. Um, so that's kind of interesting part here. Um, the next thing I'm just gonna kind of talk about real quickly is the townland information is, is another thing that you're gonna be searching a lot of um, just because Ballyfereen, so even if you just go and Google Ballyfereen County Limerick, um, I'm gonna flip over to this one because this is um, one, another thing that's gonna be indexed. And I'm assuming we can see the townland information here, but um, so if we search for Ballyfereen, this is uh, townlands.ie and that's linked. Um, and you'll see that in different websites that'll, that'll kind of show you for links. So you can search this to kind of see where um, it comes in and it's kind of one of those that you see and all of a sudden it shows you that Valley Farine is in the county of Cork and well you surely mean to sink like it was in county Limerick and so um, you just need to be careful because there's also a, a Valley Farine with two R's and two E's that's in county Limerick um, so as you go through, you can kind of start looking through, um, and I'm going to flip over here to another one. So if you have a townland, you can kind of search that townland information directly. Um, or if you're not sure, this um, swilson.info is another great one. There's a lot of good stuff that comes through here. Um, this townland database that pops up, um, you can kind of search by townland name, or you can search by just the start of a name. So if we just search Bally F in County Limerick, you can see all the different little townlands that start with that. And then maybe you would have seen Bally Farin, but then there's also Bally Foling, Bally Fo, you know, and then you get into, and there's also, there's like Bally Varin. And so there's very similar. So you just have to be very careful um, and, and Kind of confirm these things. Um, just be open though that it could be one little misspelling or one letter can send you into a different county uh, entirely. So just kind of be on the look for that. Um, but when you see these kind of things, so if we get back to you know, kind of make notes of any time you find this townland information, I would just make a separate note of what parish it's showing in, what barony, what poor law union, and what county because. That's why I said sometimes you may find records that indicate this Ula or, or Kuna, um, but just kind of the more you can associate names uh, together, you know, it may help you just kind of piece the puzzle together. So you can also search on different things over here. And we may come back to this one a little bit later because 
I had to use some of these kind of things to search for um, tombstone inscriptions that um, the way they were spelled didn't exist in terms of the database. So let me switch out of here and hopefully we're there. Um, there again, we'll just kind of whip through this with the, the marriage records. So that's kind of the journey if you know you had ancestors in Ireland and you had some census records to work with that maybe helped you give you some of those indications like we just discovered some names uh, or some civil registrations that got you some townland information. Because when we're starting to look back, um, and especially anybody that's kind of dealing with um, you know, Sierra's case or her family kind of came over in 1830, almost all of my family that came over, 14 of their 16, they almost all were came over in the famine era, um, 1845, 1852, um, when the mass migrations were kind of happening due to the famine. Um, so it's harder to jump back 50 years from 1901, but if they weren't even there, it's, it's hard enough. But so finding that townland of origin for people that may have been in America for 50 years or something like that is the challenge. Um, Cause if you can find that it can unlock a lot of information. And so I'm just gonna kind of go through a little bit of the things that um, areas where you might be able to find that um, cause you might be able to find out what county they came from a little bit easier, but trying to dig into what part of the county they came from is, is the trick. So finding town land of origin is, is kind of our goal here. So we're going to kind of just go through these. We're not going to go into too in depth because you're probably already familiar with naturalization, cemetery, you know, cemetery immigration passenger list, but just going to kind of highlight them just in terms of where we might be able to, to get them. So naturalization records. So this is um, one from 1843, and it was actually filed in Massachusetts. Um, but naturalization records, as you can see here, um, the way this one was written, it indicates at least a town that he was born at Dungarvan in the county of Waterford. Um, on the, you know, so you've got a town, a county, and then you've got a date of birth. So naturalization records can be really good if we're going to start digging back into church records. So hopefully that's, that's good information. The problem with naturalization records is, is prior to 1906, every kind of court, every state um, or county or whatever kind of created their own form. So there's no consistency prior to 1906. So, you know, while Massachusetts kind of the way they worded it kind of prompted somebody to give uh, more than just the county or the country of origin, um, most of, most of the times on naturalization records, you're probably just going to get native of Ireland or um, United Kingdom and they're renouncing their um, allegiances to that, um, to that country. But so in this case, you know, if you're researching David Welch in, you know, Boston, maybe you get a breakthrough and you can at least track him back to Dungarvan. Um, but just on naturalization records, there was multiple processes, you know, is it because it took three, you know, three years and then there was a couple filings that you, or five years really of residency, but you could file petitions and declarations of intent. And so there's different forms that may exist out there and they all may have been worded differently. So just seek out as many as you can find and check them because uh, you don't know they might've been on there. Not everybody finished the process. Um, and you can search if they were in the United States kind of the 1900 to 1930 censuses will at least give you some information on whether or not they were ever naturalized or naturalized or if they're aliens or uh, if they started the process and they haven't been finalized. So if you just look for those NAs in the box and things like that. Um, and also maybe the year of naturalization at least helps you narrow down those records. Ancestry and family search are the, the big places are gonna be the best spots to kind of search those out. Um, Immigration and emigration lists, you know, this is a source of eminent frustration for me because I can never find any of my um, Irish ancestors on passenger lists. And the reality is, is that especially kind of the earlier part of migrations, there was a lot of chain migration. Um, people didn't travel as families very much. They came over one at a time, sent money back, brought the next family member over. So chain migration is not a new phenomenon. Um, so in that case, it's really difficult to try to figure out which you know, Michael Sullivan is my Michael Sullivan when there's a hundred coming through every year. And I, I maybe roughly know that they came in in, the, in a certain decade. But um, so depending on what you get, uh, sometimes people are very consistent about, you know, on the, on the census records, what year they came over. Other times they're, you know, four and five years apart. So it's really tricky to kind of narrow it down. But 
you might get lucky. Uh, this is an older passenger list from 1920. And kind of what I've seen is kind of once you get past 1883, they started getting a little bit more detailed and specific about it. And then you'll get something more than Ireland. Um, so, but on this particular thing here, you're going to get at least again, so you've got different towns within the county. So it, it's again, it's at least one more level down to kind of narrow it down in terms of just the names. And so um, maybe you've got two people from Clona Kilty in County Cork, maybe they're family members that helps you kind of narrow it down. Probably, uh, I think it's the, uh, the Tobins here, Kathleen and Bernard. So that case looks like maybe, um, yeah, it's kind of small, but hired worker and a maid. So it could have been the family member kind of telling the age, they might've been siblings, but um, again, immigration list, ancestry, if you're not familiar, genealogy branches is one I just kind of came across. It's just a good, source of other other sites to go search. Um, Steve Morris is another one that just is kind of the one-stop shop in terms of just has a great um, passenger lists database and things like that. So if you haven't checked those websites out, um, it's just places to kind of go and explore. Um, kind of one thing I just kind of point out just because one of my uh, families, the Clearies kind of um, took the route through Canada. So if anyone you know is kind of aren't familiar with the migrations, um, a, a lot of Irish um, emigrated into Canada. It was cheaper than emigrating to the United States. So um, for cash strapped, especially the people on the West Coast or the poor areas kind of in Kerry and Cork, that might've been the more appealing option to kind of get out. Um, so I think they said almost between 1830 and 1850, 600,000 people left Ireland and went to Canada. Some of those stayed two days and crossed the border and came to the United States. Others like my, my family, the Clary's were in Ontario's um, censuses for three decades. So um, just be looking and be open that not everybody came to New York. Um, some of them went to Canada and maybe you need to start looking in some, some other parts just to see um, where you might be able to find them. Uh, a lot of times people too, um, a lot of times it was the laborers that, that were leaving just because they were working on the farms um, they didn't have land themselves, um, you know, so maybe they were the first to go. The farmers kind of um, tended to leave in less numbers, but still at a high number. But, um, you know, they had to come find work. Um, you know, my family kind of came through Canada and then they settled all in pretty much Ohio working on the railroads or finding those farmlands where they could kind of resume their former lives a little bit. Um, but so just kind of keep an eye on that. Uh, passport applications would be another option. You know, maybe your your family member decided to go home and visit. Um, most of the ones left because they didn't have a lot of money, so they probably didn't have a ton of money to go back home. But there's some, and it's possible. Um, this is Mary Blake again, um, also from Boston, I believe. Um, at least her children were born in Boston, and again, so this is another case of Massachusetts being very friendly in terms of how they worded their forms, but and their um, in their passport application, you know, she had indicated where she was born at Dungarvan in County Waterford in Ireland on or about 1840 of September 1st. So um, she didn't, re you know, she didn't finish it out and emigrated in terms of what ship or year or anything else in terms of when she came in, but at least you've got a potential birth date to seek out in a town with a name. Um, you don't know her maiden name, but it's potentially you might be able to find a Blake um, you know, in Dungarvan or something like that um, through other means if we know um, from her death record maybe what her mother's maiden name was or something like that. You might be able to find um, that type of information in a marriage record in the church registers. But um, so you've got children's names here. They were all born in, in Boston, Mass. So it's not going to help you as much there, but at least, um, you know, that is a, an option where just a passport going to visit home or returning to Ireland or something will help. Um, this is probably going to be one of your best shots in terms of finding that town name information. Um, tombstone inscriptions is where you maybe see it a little bit more frequently than other places. Um, this was true in my family. So uh, my Morrissey lines and, and Michael Morrissey was my third great grandfather. Um, his wife, Ellen Frere, um, but both of them on their tombstones listed um, the parish that they came from, Modelaga. And this is again where it's, it's hard to see on the image, but it's spelled on the on the stone m-o-d-e-l-e-g-a now that's again i i'm kind of chalking that up to again irish pronunciation these not being necessarily literate people at the time 
maybe still with some fairly heavy accents. Um, that's how it maybe was sounded, Medalaga. Um, and my Irish language is, is non-existent, so it's hard for me to know. But within Waterford, there is a parish named Medalago, or at least that's how it's spelled, M-O-D-E-L-L-I-G-O. And I believe the I-G-O is sometimes pronounced like the ga, Medalaga. So um, this is where my, my learning will still continue. Um, but that at least gives you a parish based on the tombstone to kind of track that down farther rather than just looking for any Michael Morrissey's in, in Waterford. Um, Ellen Frere, his wife, her stone indicated um, Knockbee and um, K-N-O-C-K-B-E-E. -E. And similarly, there's no Knockbee um, in, uh, in Waterford, but there are some Knockboy, which again, I don't know if the B-O-Y is more pronounced B or B. And so maybe that's how it was sounded when they pronounced it. So they did the best they could, but at least that gives you some parish or townland information. Um, the Knockboy is a town, Modelago is a, a parish. So it um, doesn't get everything you need, but at least it's a starting point to kind of dig from. So Death Index is, is again, just kind of a, a place if you're not sure where to look, just to kind of help, you know, searching for death certificates. Um, cemetery records. Obviously, most people are familiar with find a grave, but more and more stones are being photographed. So maybe you get lucky or maybe you, you put in a request and a volunteer takes a picture of the stone just so you can rule it in or rule it out. But visit those cemeteries. And that's where, again, I would kind of say, make sure you're researching the entire family. Look for every family member stone um, on those lines because um, it might not have been Michael Morrissey, but it might have been his brother that insisted upon putting his parish. Or maybe Michael put that on for his brother if his brother died sooner, but then nobody knew what it was to put it on his stone. But, you know, you don't know. Um, so search for siblings and family members or, you know, if their parents, if they were here, just to kind of see, it, it's not gonna be on all of their stones, but all you need it to be is on one of them uh, to maybe get that breakthrough um, to kind of get back into Ireland. So, uh, so tombstones are, are gonna be there, but anything you can have, cemetery records, sexton records, um, you know, you don't know, just depending on who finished out the form, and what level of detail they gave on the death certificate, you might get lucky. Um, so this was, again, this was kind of, we were on this swilson.info site before, and this was just to kind of show you again, this is kind of looking for Waterford, anything that starts with knock B, um, and then you can kind of see. So you've got several different ones, you know, the size of that particular townland, but at least that's kind of narrows it down, but there's four different townlands based on what barony and what poor law union. So again, the more you can kind of say, if I can narrow that down to Dungarvan Parish, well, then that, that helps me narrow it down this way. Um, or maybe it's a barony or a poor law, you know, any of that information may help you differentiate one for the next. And that, that'll help uh, if there's multiple people living in that town with the same name or something like that. But, so you can kind of search through all of those things. So take advantage of those sites and explore and play around with those. Um, church records, and I'm just gonna kind of put here in this kind of a, a quick plug just for the work a lot of libraries and genealogical societies and, and different places do in terms of trying to index and catalog a lot of that information. Um, you know, because we got lucky on one of my side and it's actually the Higgins side that, that our breakthrough in terms of townland information came from my mother back in the 80s kind of went to their local parish, St. Patrick's in London, Ohio. And um, luckily my cousin happened to be a nun and, and that kind of opened the door to the parish records for them that most of the time are closed. But um, they were able to just transcribe anything they could find with anything with a Morrissey or a Higgins or any of our family names. They just wrote down everything they could while they were there. And so one of the, one of the um, John Higgins, my third great grandfather, his brother, or one of his children, Thomas, um, or actually no, it's his, yeah, no, it's his, his brother. But um, on his baptismal certificate, it listed um, the townland information of his parents. So it's like the, uh, the Higgins and the Kirks, you know, so you had Valley Borney and Valley, Valley Cotton in terms of just from that baptismal certificate. And it's not on all of them. And I don't know why it was on that one, but um, that particular priest, or that particular day when they were filling it out, he just asked for what part of Waterford, maybe for all we know, I don't, or Cork or wherever it was, you know, maybe they were from there, who knows, but it was there. And so if you're not searching out all of those different records of the siblings, maybe you don't find that. Um, so ch check in as much as you can on that. Um, 
I tried to find an example of one in Covington, but every we have a lot of microfilm you know, up in local history and genealogy of a lot of the um, the Catholic um, archdiocesan records here. So you've got baptismal records and that from um, the cathedral and and other churches around. None of them said anything more than than um, Ireland. So I couldn't uh, couldn't find a good example for for Kentucky Covington based, but. Um, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist, um, but definitely look out those kind of places. There's repositories have access to that kind of stuff. Archdiocese of Cincinnati um, records were added to Find My Past, and you can get to Find My Past through the library's web. Or I think it's still unrestricted to being in the building, but um, if you come in, you can search for that uh, on any of the computers inside the library. Um, maybe they maybe they have something there too. Um, and I know my mother has done it in the past, and I've done it before too in terms of just oops writing to those dioceses and some of the more dioceses now are doing genealogical research for a fee and they'll transcribe um, whatever they can find um, you know for that so take advantage of that if you can um, we've gotten records out of new york city without having to go to new york just because we were able to get people to do it for us so that was very helpful so so seek out church records as an opportunity um, military records will kind of flip through this is again You'll see I got kind of stuck on a Dungarvan kick just because that was the easiest thing to remember. But um, this was Mike Power. So this was his draft registration card. And again, most of the time, they'll just say, where were you born? Maybe you get a county. Most of the time, you might just get Ireland or something. But he was very proud and, and indicated his, his town of birth. So Dungarvan and Waterford in Ireland. So maybe you get lucky like that. Service records maybe have been, you know. So it's again, seek out as much as you can. Maybe it's in a pension file. Maybe it's in, you know, um, a cemetery um, internment data card or something like that. Military indexes is just another web uh, website that kind of helps direct you to other um, military related sites. So just adding that in there because that was kind of a new one for me when I um, kind of started exploring it and reading through records. Um, county histories is another one. So if you're looking through um, kind of like Sierra was kind of mentioning at the beginning, those weren't on here. She was talking about some of her family members that were kind of came in early in 1850 and or, or 1830, in fact, and, and were way out in Nebraska and the Oklahoma areas. Um, you're getting out into those types of town. You're talking about very early settlers and you know people that were founding families of those towns that may be featured in things like county histories. Um, I had family members in this Mundota part of Illinois, again, as they were kind of working on the railroads and moving west. Um, some of these people put down roots and, and started building, you know, large farms and became successful cattle barons and things like that. And, you know, that might have been your a, a cousin or your relative or something like that. But maybe it lists here. This one doesn't give us much information. I just put it on here because at least it I mentioned County Fermanagh. Uh, but, um, you know, you might get more information, but at least you've got you know, a birth date. So you, maybe you can check that into church histories. You've got an immigration date. So in 1819, so there's not going to be as many people coming over that early. So maybe you get lucky on a passenger ship list. Um, you've got a place of arrival in diff different Harrison County, Ohio. So again, maybe it's not in this particular history, but maybe you find something in the history of Harrison County, Ohio, um, whatever it may be. But you've got a different thing. So you've got is married to Jane Knox, who also says Jane Knox was from County Tyrone. Um, so you've got a lot of good information in these things. So don't don't rule those out. Just definitely seek seek out the uh, the county histories you don't know. Um, obituaries is probably going to be one of your other better bets, um, or just newspaper articles in general. Um, mainly just because you can cast a, a pretty wide net anymore. Um, you can get with your library card here in Kent County quite a quite a exhaustive um, access to newspapers.com, newspaper archive, as well as local papers, um, Post, Enquirer, you know. Uh, Courier journals, among more. Um, Chronicling America is kind of the um, uh, Library of Congress's effort to kind of make freely available a lot of newspapers from around the country. Um, but there's countless things in, in local libraries and historical genealogical societies have different articles or obituaries on their websites or provide free access to newspaper archives. I know I, I just put one from the Brooklyn Daily Eagle because I, I found a lot of my New York side on my Duryea side through um, just the free subscription from the book Brooklyn Public Library made available Brooklyn Daily Eagle. And so if you have a registration, you know, that's all you really need to do. And then you can kind of search that for free rather than paying it. It's now you can get it through newspapers.com. But 
at the time, free was good. Um, I had the same luck with um, Monmouth County in New Jersey with their local library too. But as you can kind of see, so this is again, this is another, another lad from Ben Garvin, but Thomas Nugent from Ben Garvin in Waterford in 1799. So it's again, so it's kind of anyone that kind of has these kind of silver anniversaries, um, birthday celebrations, maybe somebody's cousins visited from Ireland and they indicated the town in this kind of like those social stories that you see pop up in newspapers a lot, especially the small town papers of news and notes and what's happening around the city um, kind of thing. Or maybe somebody traveled there and that's just noted that they traveled to Ireland to visit relatives. Maybe they'll tell you where they went. Um, so just don't rule any of those things out, but those are another good opportunities. DNA is going to become increasingly um, an area of focus. And if you really have no clue, this might be your only shot in terms of if you have just a bunch of dead ends and, and nothing more than, hey, they came from Ireland type of, of um, leads. Um, this is kind of a quick breakdown of mine. Most of mine are from kind of Southwestern um, uh, Ireland. So you kind of see, uh, I've got clans from Waterford and there's parts in Cork and down here into Cork and Kerry. Oops. Um, and I've got some from Limerick and Tipperary, kind of one little branch, and it's got like one guy up in um, Dublin too. But so as you can kind of see, um, there's a lot more surname groups that are showing up that are helping kind of refine results and compare people of the same surname. So you're seeing different surname DNA groups kind of coming in just to kind of explore that. The more those, those pools get bigger, uh, the results get refined, and you can really kind of narrow in on... Um, Maybe if you just get a lot of matches and relatives, maybe there's some that are still living there now. It can really help you at least use DNA to kind of narrow it down to at least a region. So at least if you can kind of say, if I can get it to a county level, at least you've got maybe a fighting chance at that point. But hopefully you've got a, an uncommon name uh, or something to go with it. And that, that'll help maybe narrow it down. But um, if you haven't done the DNA test, that's kind of good. It's gotten a little bit better. Um, I've gotten less and less Scandinavian as they've updated their results. So. Uh, you know, 14 out of my 16 great grandparents puts me at about 44%. So they've got me at 46%. Um, and I can pretty much confirm all, four, all 14. So that's pretty close for me in terms of that. And there might be a straggler on my father's side that, that kind of invaded the island at some point. But um, so that's a kind of a good way to kind of definitely dig in, check it Ancestry or uh, 23andMe, any of the other places in that point, um, or submit it to all of them. Um, I just kind of threw this one in for fun and it has nothing to do with Ireland, but it's kind of like I mentioned my dad's side, that lone Scotsman that's kind of floating out there that we were struggling to figure out which part of Scotland, but um, they were kind of digging in my dad's notes and I found an interview my aunt had done of her great aunt at some point. And she had mentioned her family came from Kirk and Tillock um, in Scotland and, you know, and passed down in the family. I've got this bottle of mine's full, but it's got this bottle of Duggan's Dew but it was made, came from Kirk and Tillock. And it's kind of one of those things that I said, just look at everything around your house sometimes that have been passed down in the family. And just remember that it's got passed down for a reason sometimes. I mean, it might've just been nobody wanted to drink it, but other times it's just, somebody bought it because it had the name of the, uh, the town where the family originated from or something like that. So make note of family lore. Uh, there's usually some truth in it. And again, look for old papers, photos, clues, anything like that. Because again, the, the biggest trick is finding that town information or something that you can get into. Um, because with that information, we can start digging into the kind of the next thing. Um, and the next thing that you're kind of looking into when we'll get to church records in a bit, but is property records. Um, so without the survey or the census, that's gonna give you maybe all the different family members. We're down to basically have household type documents. Um, and that's gonna be property owner information or um, property valuation of of the value of land and, and um, homes and renting and things like that. So the biggest one that most people will turn to in terms of Irish um, genealogy is Griffith's valuation. So you may have heard of that, um, but this was basically uh, a land survey. So they were just trying to determine the value of property. Um, so this is the years it took place. Um, so they went door to door, um, looking at property, assessing mainly the quality of the land. Um, so in, in that particular point, which not great because some of this was during the, uh, the famine period. So the land was probably not very good at all, but trying to do taxation. So 
people um, had taxes. They had to help support the Church of Ireland. They had to pay for roads and, and upkeep of the church or things like um, the poorhouses or the workhouses. Um, so in terms of the poor relief and different things like that. So, um, so they had to have know what to tax people. They had to know how much things were worth. So just like your properties are valued now, so they did then back then. So they're looking for who owned what, who rented what, and what's the value of the property. Uh, but again, this is only the only the head of the household is identified and it's searchable again. So they've made this freely available. The big website that we'll, we'll kind of start at is this askaboutireland.ie. But again, once it's there, Ancestry says, we'll index that, find my pass says, we'll index that, we'll make it searchable. So you can access Griffith's valuation many different ways. Um, so but again, I just kind of mentioned the, the free option for those at home that maybe don't have the Ancestry subscription. And, and right now I think we're still extended um, from the library and Sierra can probably chop in on that if, if it's there. I, I can't remember if it was through December or if it got even extended again, they keep extending how much um, the Ancestry library is, is remotely available. But um, so the nice thing about some of the different websites is that the properties are cross-referenced with the surveys or different maps. So you can kind of, kind of see exactly where that town land is if you can see where it exists current current day. Um, so this, I'll uh, just give credit to the Irish Genealogy Toolkit, which is another, another thing I read a lot about in terms of their site. Um, so I kind of plucked this map just to kind of demonstrate. So we kind of took almost 15 years to kind of do the full valuation. And so um, you really have to kind of figure out exactly when your ancestor might have been in that particular county to be tracked into it. So they were doing um, you know, Dublin took between 47 and 51. So you're gonna to need to find somebody who was a property owner or rented head of household at that point in time in that part of the county. Whereas if they were from County Antrim, which is kind of up here at the very North, you're waiting almost 10 years later. So you, if you don't think there's somebody there, if they came over in 1855, well, they're not gonna show up in the Griffiths valuation. So you gotta have somebody that was still in town. So it might've been the parents, not necessarily the person that came to America. Um, so hopefully you can find that you've got that next, at least a name for the next generation back that you can kind of hopefully at least rule it down. Um, so this is Griffith's valuation. This is on, um, and we're going to click out of here, but this is ancestry or ask about Ireland.ie and the Griffith's valuation. So we'll do the same search and this one, we're going to do something that's a little less, um, common than Michael O'Connor and different things like that. So we're just going to search for a Joseph Terrell. So we'll search broadly just because I don't know how many people are going to come in. Well, I do. But um, so again, this is the advantage of if you don't have a very um, common name, you might be able to narrow it down fairly quickly. So hopefully you've got uncommon names. And so in this case, Joseph Terrell, there's only four head of households that showed up within that 15 year period. Um, and so you've got county. So maybe you do know a county of origin. And so maybe they did come from Offaly in Kings County. Um, or maybe you have Geschel from a different record of some other point or some other point of origin. So we're just going to use him as an example here. So hopefully this is who we were looking for, Kings County and Offaly. So you can click on the details here with the little magnifying glass. So that kind of just says the family name. So it's, so they were renting from the landlord, Bowen Saunders. So that can, again, this is where I, I tell you always make note of these or take a picture of this or, or snip it somewhere along the way because you're looking at, this is where you can get union information, parish information, town land and place type thing. So you're really saying, if I can really get everybody to a Valley Crumlin level of um, detail in terms of where they lived, the better chances you are of really finding your records uh, for your ancestors. So so it also say this was taken on 1854. And so that kind of gives you an idea of when Joseph Terrell was there. So. Um, so you've got three different options here in terms of the original page, in terms of how big that you want to see the original. We'll just blow it up since we're watching the screen. Okay, so this is how it kind of comes in. These are, I believe they were probably transcribed, obviously, at some point, but printed. But you can kind of see... So you're looking for your townland information. So you've got the Valley Crumlin or you're looking for Joseph Terrell. 
and you can see, so this is the next column is your landlord. <clears throat> and you can see um, Boehm Saunders himself was renting all of this land from the Earl of Digby or Earl Digby. So um, kind of gives you an idea. What you're looking over here is descriptions of it. So this is the description of it, the house, the offices and the land. Um, now the house kind of speaks for itself. Offices pretty much meant anything from stables and barns. So it could be where the pigs lived it could have been a shop or something like that. Um, I don't know if there's any other ones down here that kind of, sometimes you'll see like a, uh, maybe a mill or something like that. But typically offices might've been just a, an outhouse kind of where the, the, the pigs or the sheep kind of lived. Um, you'll get over here, number of acres. It's a little harder to see. And let's see if I can blow this up. Yeah, it's a little better. So you'll get area. So these are kind of in, um, not necessarily things we're familiar with, but these are acres, roods, and oh, geez, what's the other one? Um, uh, no. uh, part, uh, I forget what the P stands for, but um, so as you can kind of see, um, Boehm Sanders had 85 different acres um, for total. The land was 47 uh, in terms of value, so that's how much it was valued, it was pounds, shillings, and pence. So he had his land was valued at 47 pounds. Um, and so you've got pretty much the whole property here. Uh, Joseph Terrell himself only had a house. Um, his, his building was valued at uh, 10 shillings, whereas um, I believe it was 20 shillings to a pound. So if you're looking at, he was 55 shillings compared to 10. So Boehm Saunders had a much larger house than Joseph Terrell in terms of value. So. That's in terms of just the land, the value of the land, so they could assess taxation. But again, the biggest thing here is if you can, if you really can narrow it down. And in this case, if you're looking for Joseph Terrell and he's the only one that's in County Offaly, you're feeling pretty good about it. And now you've got a town land information that kind of goes with it. So we'll close out of that one real quick. Um, so there you've got the map views that you can kind of get into as well. Um, so we'll click this one over just to, so you can kind of see what the, uh, I just lost that for a second. Let's try that again. All right, we'll do this as a quick break to take a drink. Patience is not one of my virtues, so it's a good thing we waited. But so this kind of gives you, you've got up in here is kind of a historical map versus a modern map. So as you can kind of give you an idea of, of where we're looking at in terms of that property. Um, so you can kind of show the towns. Um, this is Geshill, you know, so kind of gives you an idea of where you're at. So as we move to more of a modern map, you can kind of see the same property. And so you've got maybe roads or different things. So if you're visiting, you want to kind of go visit the old homestead, you can kind of narrow it down a little bit more into um, just exactly what part of County Offaly. Um, maybe you just want to kind of go visit and get a sense of this is where I'm from. So kind of cool. Um, so you've got some different options here that you can kind of look into. And yeah. I shouldn't have clicked on that because I don't really even know what that did, but um, so we'll hide those. But so you've got the maps to kind of play with um, as well. And you can upload your content, which I haven't really explored, but I think if you have additional information about Joseph Terrell in here, I think you can upload more information and kind of be more of a social group to it. But um, so that's kind of how you would search Griffith's valuation. Um, let me see here. Um, it's, oh, acres, roods, and poles. So 40 poles makes one rood, and roods are a quarter of an acre. So everything you needed to know. Um, the other things that you kind of do is sometimes that you'll see, and I'll make a note here. Um, I haven't encountered it yet in any of the searching I've done, but sometimes you'll find, obviously, there might be um, people of the same name within the same town. Um, they said a lot of times the people doing the evaluations would try to differentiate them. So 
sometimes they may put in like um, quotes behind the name, like the father's name. So in terms of like, if it's Joseph Terrell, it might be son of Edward, or if it's a junior, you might see um, junior or um, maybe sell a senior or father or, or junior or son or something like that to differentiate that person from the other others person of the same name. So you, you might get lucky that way and, and at least get a second, another generation that way. But um, just want to kind of be on the lookout for it. Um, I found some information in, in the in the valuation, but um, and there are other property ones which we'll kind of touch on a little bit um, later. So this is again in case we didn't have it. This is kind of where Bally Crumlin is. So in terms of Geschel and Bally Crumlin, so it's a little bit different than the map that I had showed before. Um, so this is particular one. And I'll just kind of say Thomas Kirk. This is my fifth grandfather, fifth great grandfather, um, who lived in Ballin Temple, Churchtown. So Churchtown became a, a name that I saw quite a bit come up in different records. So as I was we started searching in Churchtown, so that allowed it was kind of the only Kirk in Churchtown that was showing up. So um, he's kind of the anomaly in terms of, and again, this is kind of the potentially more of. Um, some of maybe English or, or Scottish because Kirk is a little bit more unless it's, and I did find another record of it kind of being Quirk, which um, he was actually more well off. So um, his property was 13 pounds and 10 shillings. So compared to some of the other poor people that kind of had the smaller places, um, but that was there. So Churchtown, I just kind of mentioned that because I think it'll probably come back a little bit later. Um, just kind of throwing this one out here just because this is one of the cool things that I kind of came across and, and why I encourage you to kind of just make sure to seek out county information in terms of maybe specific county archives that were here. So as I started looking into just, I forget one of the, the um, webinars or presentations I was watching on something mentioned this Digby Irish Estates. And you'll remember before um, the one of the guys that was the major land owner that was um, leasing land was the Earl Digby. So in County Offaly, in their archives, um, basically um, they undertook a major renovation of properties in terms of trying to increase the value and quality of homes. Um, not all necessarily a great thing because they ended up like um, evicting 400 people and shipping and putting them on a boat and shipping them to Australia. Um, so it didn't end well for about 50 of them because they died along the way, um, but for those people that stayed, including our friend Joseph Terrell, living in Bally Crumlin, you kind of get a sense of somebody that actually went around and drew images of what the house looked like. And now before and after, kind of modern day before and after. So if you're really lucky enough to kind of pull into one of these kind of things, um, I've got another one over here, Jay Brophy, and his is up here. So this is again, kind of somebody that's, his property was valued at like a pound and seven shillings versus Joseph Terrell's was valued at 10 shillings. So it kind of gives you an idea that these weren't glamorous living. Um, so this was everybody in one house with kind of one uh, fireplace. The pigs, the sheep, everybody probably lives in there too. Maybe you had a larger home with a second spot for, for the animals if the animals were inside. So this one's got like a, looks to be maybe a donkey or something like that. But so they kind of went through property renovations and those that weren't evicted, um, maybe ended up better, probably paid more in rent, but um, that's what you get a lot of times is people were renting these, these homes on the land and just working the farm or working for the, the landowner themselves. And so the soil dried up or the crops were dead, there was no work to be done, they had to go. And some went to America, some got on the boat to Australia, um, but you know, definitely seek out all of these kind of things because they might be in your county of where you're looking. Um, you know, just interesting little nuggets and gems like that that you can kind of come across. So um, just kind of other different property level books. And again, so these are kind of, once you can kind of get some of these and so see the names like Ballin Temple here, Bally May Cotter, which is very similar and right next door to Bally Cotton, which is where the um, baptismal records indicated the family was from that was the Higgins. And so in the barony of Immokili, and so you'll see a lot of these things kind of start showing up in different records and you can kind of see this is a 10 year book from 1848 Richard Higgins. Um, would be my fourth great grandfather, but so you've got kind of him showing up in 1848 here 
And so you've kind of, again, so that's another um, property record. This is uh, the house books and, and forgive me because I forget the difference between what the books are. But it's interesting to note in this particular book, you've got Richard Higgins down here across out, house destroyed in 1849. And so you can kind of come across in some of these different things. And now there was another Michael Higgins that um, was still there in Cork and in Mokili, most likely a relative of some sort, um, but Richard Higgins. And so Richard Higgins' son, John, ended up, uh, my third great grandfather was the one that came over um, to America in around 1855. Um, but did this change the fortunes of the family? You know, um, in that point in time, did that tragic fire you know, I don't know if Richard Higgins died. Did other family members, something happened? I don't know. I'm still going to do some digging and maybe there's, there's a fire. Maybe there's a newspaper article at some point that I haven't unearthed. Um, but you get little nuggets like this, but only if you can get it down to looking at these things where you're finding names like the, the Ballin Temple or Bell, and you see these things return. So this is again, 1834. And you've got, there's Church Town that showed up again, Bally McCotter and Richard Higgins. So there's all these different things that are out there. Griffith's valuation is the big one, but there are these tie the plotman books in terms of, um, you know, um, what you owe to the church and different things like that. Um, all right, so we're cooking here. So sorry, I'm going really long. So sorry to bear with me. Church records is the next big one, and, and this is the kind of Roots Ireland is is the one that's kind of the subscription site, and it can be very costly. Um, it does have cover most of the Ireland in terms of church records. And when I'm talking church records here, it's talking about Catholic church records. Um, you know, um, not as much of the Anglican and Church of Ireland stuff. If it survived, this is available as some of the, the Catholic church records are. Um, so the subscriptions can be very costly. So a lot of the same information can be covered by other means. So I would kind of start other places and maybe research and exhaust what you can do and then maybe spring for the 24 hour marathon searching session for 20 bucks, which is what I'm planning to do. I haven't, haven't purchased my subscription yet because um, I'm still trying to dig into to get through everything else I'm finding first before I can kind of go through um, irishgenealogy.ie. And I mentioned that before, there are church records on there that cover Cary, West Cork and Dublin city. So it's again, much less 3 million compared to 20 million. Um, whereas this covers most of the island. But you can get to the parish registers through other ways, um, linking some of the other things that you can search, the ireland.anglican.org. You can kind of see where some of the other Anglican records are. Um, they might, sometimes they're in county by county. Sometimes they're at um, the, the records office. Um, some are available, some are not. But um, Irish Genealogical Research Society is another one, irishancestors.ie. It's a subscription-based one too. Sometimes you can search the databases for free, but it's a subscription-based too. Um, this I'm going to go back to Irish genealogy. This is Martin Cleary, my third great grandparents too. And I should wrap up because we're showing it. So remember, we're searching only a limited number of places here. Still not a robot. Um, so again, so we kind of know when they show up, this was the, the family that ended up going through Canada. Um, so then can't say for certain of it, but um, at least the timeline at least makes sense. Um, they were married when they, as far as I knew, when we first picked them up in the, in the Canadian census and things like that, and their children were born over there. So it's possible they met getting on the boat, who knows? Um, and it's possible it's not even my ancestors, so. But it's close, but it kind of shows you that you can kind of get to them um, and you can view the record. Which, um, as you get into some of these, as you start getting into Catholic church records, um, you're going to find a mix. Some of the places would have recorded them in English. Some of them are going to be written in Latin. Um, so as you're searching some of these um, church record databases, you want to be cognizant of searching Latin forms of the name um, as well as English forms of the name because um, some places they may kind of be covered with variants, but you may want to look into, um, you know, there was like Michael, Michaelise, Michael Um, So you may get different results based on each of those searches and, you know, you don't want to leave one of them out if that's your ancestors. So um, 
this kind of gives you an idea. Some are easier to read than others. I don't try to remember exactly where it was. I don't think it, this has got it here. So this is Martin Cleary to Catherine Keegan, witnesses John Keogh and Sarah Keegan. So you're not going to get, get as much information in the in the church records as you are in the civil records, but uh, at least you're getting witnesses that may be another family member. Um, could be could be Catherine's uh, sister Sarah. John Keogh could be um, a family member on another side that married another sister or something like that, who knows? Um, but that at least gives you an idea. But this one was happened to be from Dublin and, the, and you can search some um, Church of Ireland and that through irishgenealogy.ie too. Uh, parish registers will be the big one. And this is another one that's completely free. This will go to the National Library of Ireland for this one, it provides free access as well. And this has got over a thousand parishes. So this is pretty much what Roots Ireland is pulling from too but um, they have their own searching and indexing, just like Ancestry and them would. Um, so this is kind of, all 32 counties are covered. So this is the, the, reg cash, uh, the parish registers at the National Library of Ireland, if you know what it is. So I think in my case, um, one of mine that I kind of run into is, this is where Churchtown is. So in the Diocese of Cloyne, different civil dioceses and parishes versus um, church parishes are different. So it's another layer of names to kind of keep track of, but um, these are the actual marriages, um, baptisms and that. So you can click on those and scroll through if you know kind of the date that you're looking for, or you can kind of scroll through. So this, as you can kind of see, we're at 1836 and this is a long way to go, but you can scroll through those parish registers just like you'd be sitting in the parish office now um, through the National Library here. You can search, um, and I think I've got it pulled up on one of these. Yeah, oh, geez. Oh, I thought I had it pulled up here, but all right, let me get back. Um, through Ancestry and whatnot. So you might be able to search for indexes. They don't necessarily have indexes to the images, but if you can find, um, you know, let's see, let me just get back here real quick. Or you, I'm just gonna say while you're searching the registers, you can search the map. Um, so if you knew they're from County Cork, you can kind of ring it um, and you can find it basically through here. So I've got some in Cloyne, I've got some in Ballynacotta, or you can kind of, look up into here, into different counties and whatnot and try to figure out that way. This is Medaligo, this is where I mentioned before. Dungarvan, this is the famous Dungarvan is right here. So um, you can kind of pull up those and pull up the registers. So this one has baptisms, no marriages, but um, they may be in a neighboring county or, um, or town, so. Um, Let's see, I think I was going to switch over to was that one here. I'll just kind of, these are, these were found through um, Ancestry. So these were some of the Higgins ancestors that I was able to find. Um, yeah, well, it might be easier just to leave it on this one. So instead of searching, because we're running low on time here. Um, so these were different ones that you could search in Ancestry. And again, so you found mainly because I knew Richard Higgins had married Ellen Clerk. And now that I knew that they were kind of in Valley May Cotter in County Cloyne, I can kind of, you know, pin these baptisms of different children with that information. So you can search Ancestry using, and basically what I did was just search for their parents' names of anyone named Higgins in uh, Valley May Cotter or Cloyne. And, you know, at that particular point in time, there was only six people that came back and they were all from their family. So you kind of get an idea that, um, that you know, there weren't that many people there, but especially with Higgins and Kirk, um, and this is an example of what you're going to kind of see. Um, this is the bottom one here. This is William Higgins, Richard Higgins, Ellen Clerk. Then you have Thomas Kirk, which again, could have been, um, could have been the father and uh, it's hard to really pronounce what that last one is, but this is Valley McCotter is kind of the, the residence. Um, this is an example from searching it in Find My Past. So this is Find My Past's kind of link here. So again, it's the kind of 
they've got all those things indexed. So this is Richard Higgins in Cloyne with um, father's name, Richard Higgins, mother's name, Ellen Kirk. And this, and when you're looking in here, this will give you um, a link to the National Library of Ireland's um, kind of site to do it. So again, you've got the parish name and then you've got the alternative parish name, which again, gets you down to church town, which is what we kept seeing uh, reoccur. Um, so this is again, this was a marriage record, and this is the one I was mentioning before. This is again Churchtown. So is this coincidence or not? Churchtown in Cloyne. This is um, Richard Higgins married Ellen Quirk um, in the presence of other people. So the time is right before, in terms of like before they started having children. Um, is Quirk equal to Kirk? I don't know, but it's it's at least something to look into a little bit more. Um, because at least we can trace Kirks from Thomas Kirk into the Churchtown area, and we have Higgins in the Churchtown area, the ages and names seem right. It's certainly possible, but um, it's really difficult to do if you didn't have at least something like the town land to kind of tie it together. Um, this is just kind of, in terms of find my past, this is just kind of a, a quick breakdown. You know, you can just look for Ireland records. Things like the parish registers were over here. You can search those for free uh, and on Find My Past, and you can search the census records too. Um, they may make you register for it. So even though you need your library card or you can only access Find My Past through the library's portal from inside the building, you can access certain Irish records remotely because uh, the affiliations with the National Library of Ireland or the, the National Archives, um, that's the conditions of granting them access to the original register rolls and scans is to say you have to make them freely available. So. They did it, but they wanted them to drive people to their website. So they're there and you should be able to access them if you want to. Um, Church of Ireland, real quick, because this is where I really lose how much information I know. Um, big chunk of the Church of Ireland were lost in 1922, but there are plenty of parish registers that do survive. So this is kind of an idea of, of there's still 30, 40, 50, 60% that are intact, but they're all over and spread out. So there's different places and we'll get to like this book, if you haven't used this book before, Tracing Your Irish Ancestors, this is pretty much your Irish genealogy Bible. So if you're going to look at this, this, this guy is the, he knows it all. Um, <laughs> so it, he'll dig into, if you're looking for Jewish ancestors in Ireland, he's got a page with different links. So definitely check out this book. I'll be turning it back in shortly. Um, hopefully not too crinkled with pages, but definitely get through this um, or visit his website, johngranham.com. Um, you can see on here there's a browse function, or you can just type in a search name. You know, Flood is one of the names that I've got that was kind of around Dublin. Um, so if you search on that, you can just kind of find some interesting information. You can kind of get into a census map of where Flood showed up in 1901, where Flood showed up in 1911. You've got down here just a number of people that show up in Griffiths and where they were. Oops. You know, this is kind of a snapshot of it, but this is from Griffiths Valuation. So if you knew, this is just kind of where where they were congregated at the time. Um, this interesting here is this kind of, I think there was another different variations of spelling. Um, so this is again, variants in um, different names. So there's a lot of information just to kind of play around on that website. Um, this is the browse function that I was circling before where you can kind of get into records and counties and they have these county by county listings. And this is where you can kind of find some of those links to those um, different districts breakdowns of what districts existed in what counties and then townland maps, there's links to immigration. And so just, it's a definite site that you should check out and explore. Um, family search, I'll just kind of plug because there's, there's a ton of tutorials out there. There's a ton of this, um, learn on your own type stuff. One of the, the things I discovered here is that just because Roots Tech, the family search kind of conference went virtual, a lot of their a lot of their sessions and that are still available and you can watch them for free. So I watched like three really preeminent Irish scholars do different different sessions on DNA genealogy with Ireland. And so if that's where you're looking at, definitely seek out things like um, using DNA for Irish genealogy and just watch a couple um, sessions and, and see where it's at. And so these are a lot of tutorials. So if you're not going to like the Family Search Wiki or Ancestry Learning Academy kind of things seek out that stuff. You'll learn more from them than you'll learn from me for sure. But um, state records, church records, there'll be ones just on Church of Ireland records. So um, throw this in here, naming patterns. 
basically from what I've seen that not followed very frequently, um, maybe more back in the older days, but um, this is kind of the naming pattern. So first son after the father's father, second son after the mother's father type of thing. So it doesn't really carry true in my family. So I don't know how much to put stock in it, but if you're looking to kind of trying to differentiate different, different records or something like that, it's something you can kind of factor in and, and just see um, if that makes any sense. So you can search this. This I found this on Family Search's wiki at some point. Um, so it's probably listed there somewhere. But there's no shortage of avenues. Like I said, one of the results I showed you earlier with the tie of the Plotman books and other property records. So the, the house records and that kind of stuff. Newspaper archives, Find My Past has some. Um, and again, the more you can kind of get into that stuff, street trade directories, pension records, even things like dog license books, people talking about prison, you know, poor relief, workhouse um, logs. Um, there's a lot of stuff that you can kind of dig into, um, but just kind of gather up as much as you can um, and do the best you can. Um, I kind of mentioned a couple of these, the Irish genealogy toolkit is a good one, but there's <coughs> plenty of things out there for researching Irish ancestry. So just kind of consume as much as you can. And I apologize, but yeah, <laughs> sorry. I knew one hour was never gonna contain me, but um, I don't know if there's any questions, I will do my best. I don't know if there's anything from the chat. Sorry for rambling so long. I'm surprised my voice held on, but. I'm gonna go ahead and end the recording. Oh yeah. Yep, let me figure out how to do that. Hold on a minute. Stop recording. <laughs>